Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my distinguished uh, panel members, guest speakers. Uh, good afternoon from Malaysia, Canada. Uh, good evening from Malaysia, and uh, good uh, the late night actually from Canada. So this is a cross-border academic uh, environment, the international symposium that we are organizing from the Canadian University of Bangladesh. Myself from Dr. Mohammad Sharuk Adnan Khan, I'm the Associate Professor and Acting Dean, School of Science and Engineering and Director of uh, ICC, Innovation and Commercial Research Center. I warmly welcome you all to this timely symposium. Uh, the title is International Symposium on Current Cross-Border Academic Environment. So let me have the honor to uh, introduce the guest panel one by one. Let's go to the, my presentation. So I have <coughs> from Australia, we have a state professor, Jasri Ravishankar from University of New South Wales, Sydney. She's uh, actually on, from the Sydney. So all of us uh, currently presenting the country and, and staying, residing in the, in, uh, the country itself. So then uh, from my left, Dr. Mari here, Mari Helen, assistant professor, Laurentian University from Canada. She's from Canada. She's joining us from there. Hello, Dr. Mari, can you say hi? Yeah. Hello, I'm pleased so, to be here. <laughs> from Malaysia, we have Asset Professor Dr. Aravind from Taylor's University. Hello, Professor, how are you? Hi, hi, hi. Uh, from honor, with, honor, uh, honor, our uh, dearest Professor, Dr. Celia Shahnaz, and also the IEEE Chair of Bangladesh, the popular, well-known figure and personality of our academia. Hello, Professor, how are you? Professor, you're Hello. Hello. Yes. It's nice to have you here. Good to have you all uh, without further delay. So <laughs> let me start our symposium. Let me share the screen. Okay, so let's start uh, the International Symposium on Current Cross-Border Academic Environment, the navigation towards the new normal. So this scenario we have been facing for the first time in our entire life. So uh, yeah, we would like to know like how our academic environment uh, and how we are coping up from different countries. We will share our academic experience, uh, like what is the country doing? What is our university doing? what kind of strategies that we are taking in consideration and also what are what is our student perspective and all, and all. overall this would be a very interesting session um, all the audience uh, please stay tuned and hold tight uh, hold on like uh, most probably you will have a very amazing experience uh, uh, in the cross border academic environment so uh, our Founder and chairman, uh, Dr. Choudhury Nafiz Sharafat uh, has conveyed a message uh, from Canadian University of Bangladesh to the <coughs> audience and distinguished faculty members and the guest speakers. Let me just quote it, uh, the message from the chairman. Welcome to International Symposium on Current Cross-Border Academic Environment. I'd like to thank all the distinguished faculty members and researchers to participate in this symposium as keynote speakers. It is an absolute honor having the prudent scholars with us from four different parts of the world, Australia, Canada, Malaysia, and Bangladesh. My best wishes to all of you. So this is the message from our chairman. Uh, 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 since the organizer is the Canadian University of Bangladesh, I would uh, just uh, briefly give you an introduction about our university. Uh, the university started June 2016. Uh, this is uh, one of the emerging universities, private universities in Bangladesh. Uh, we have three schools, School of Science and Engineering, uh, that consists of Tripoli Electrical and Electronic Engineering Department, Computer Science and Engineering Department, and Shipping and Maritime Science. And School of Business consists of BBA and uh, uh, MBA and EMBA. School of Liberal Arts consists of three departments, English, Film and Television, which is FNT, and Law. The current address is Prabhuti Sharoni, Dhaka, Bangladesh. We have few uh, 
flagship features of our university, which is a great transfer to Canadian, American, Malaysian, Thailand, and other international universities. We have industry-specific learning, exclusive four months of industrial training. Uh, we have Innovation Commercialization Center, Center of Entrepreneurship and Sustainable Development, 18 research cells, an IoT lab. We have the JICA affiliation, uh, uh, and we provide training to skill uh, to prepare skilled engineers for Japan. We have state of art laboratories, IoT lab, machines lab, computer labs, eminent faculty members from uh, foreign international universities, and international. We have a huge international student pool from Somalia, Nigeria, uh, Philippines, and all the way from from other countries. So welcome to the International Symposium. Let us get started. Uh, I will introduce with the guest panel. I already introduced it. So let me just uh, make it official. From Australia, Dr. Jayasri Ravishankar is joining us. Is, she is the Associate Professor, School of Electrical Engineering and Telecommunications from University of New South Wales. Hello, everyone. Nice to have you, Professor, from Bangladesh. We are going alphabetically. Okay. We are uh, from, after Australia, from Bangladesh. We're having <laughs> Professor Dr. Surya Shanas, Department of Tripoli, Buet, and IEEE Bangladesh Chair. Hello, Professor. Hello. Then from Canada, Dr. Marie Helene, uh, Assistant Professor, School of Engineering, Laurentian University. Um, this is the most challenging time for her. It's 7 a.m. in the morning. So I appreciate your time and effort, Professor. Hope to have you. Uh, like, hope you will make a good contribution here. Hello. Hello. OK, from Malaysia, Dr. C.V. Aravind, uh, Associate Professor and Faculty of Innovation and Technology, Chelers University. He is uh, very well known to me. And like, we have been working in the research academy for like around 10 years. Hello, Doctor. How are you? Hello, Professor. Hello, hello, thank you. For the closing session chair, uh, Professor Dr. Muhammad Mahfuz al-Islam, our Honorable Vice Chancellor from Canadian University of Bangladesh, he will join. And the program host is myself, I'm the Associate Professor, School of Engineering and Director ICC, Canadian University of Bangladesh. So, since our Introduction part uh, finishes. So I would like to ask uh, Dr. Aravind, uh, Associate Professor, Taylor's University of Malaysia, to uh, give the first keynote. I leave the floor to him. Thank you. Taylor's University is the first engineering school outside the US to offer the Grand Challenge Scholars Program. The Grand Challenges Scholar Program requires us to fulfill five different aspects. So most of the projects that we do have to align back to the grand challenge that we chose. We have to first choose the grand challenge. So my challenge is engineering tools for scientific discovery. I actually took up the one of the 14 grand challenges as the wastewater treatment. We have to provide access to clean water. We actually sold our product to Middle Eastern investors. We go to different countries or we get exposed to different perspectives of different people from different parts of the world. Whereas the Grand Child Scholar Program, it gives you a network of people that you actually realize there are people who want to make changes in the world. And when you get like-minded people together, you can make change. Come take a look at our world-class laboratories and feel the vibe of real-world hardware facilities. where the creativity, deadlines, teamwork, and passion experience here are very real. We experience the thrill of the test run to the sobering return of the drawing board, and ultimately the hard earned moment of success. This innovative framework is through the implementation of the CDIO, pioneered by none other than MIT. Taylor's University School of Engineering is the first Malaysian university to be accepted into this collaboration with elite institutions. CDIO emphasizes on student participation as part of an initiative to encourage their passion by having their mind and skills working through project-based learning. To bridge into industrial exposure, Taylor's has forged strategic alliances with members of the engineering community to ensure our curriculum remains in line with the industry demands. And from the industry perspective, 
Taylor serves as an Asian lab and gateway to innovation, talent, and research activities. We are the first engineering school in Malaysia to offer Euphoria, an industrial adoption program. Students will work with a multinational company on real-life industrial challenges throughout their degree, leading to an internship and employment with the same company. Taylor's really has a, a great plan going on here. It really equips us with practical knowledge and how we're going to address it in the future. So we get to do more practical stuff and actually apply the knowledge instead of learning it theoretically. You know, everyone can learn, but applying what you've learned is also another thing that is really important. So being here in Taylor's, the project based learning has helped me a lot. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction, uh, Dr. Shah Rukh. Uh, uh, I'm happy to be uh, one of the panelists uh, talking about the new normalcy. Uh, in my uh, presentation, what I try to do, I will walk through you uh, why we need to have a new type of educational model at the first moment, then how we need to go forward to have this educational model to become sustainable. And finally, I will uh, explain to you like what will be the uh, end point of uh, this, uh, what we call as a new normal educational model. Okay, so uh, this is a very uh, generic uh, scenario. Every one of us know, particularly from the engineering field, we know. Uh, we talk about IR 4.0, which is uh, somewhere in 2000, started in 2000, and now it's booming towards 2020. But let's go back to the uh, arena where it is well before the first revolution. So during that time, uh, the only purpose of living is to have an agriculture field. Then uh, you are living ends with uh, cultivating crops and, you know, like uh, live with uh, some sort of uh, animals, uh, uh, you know, right up uh, like your goat or uh, chicken or whatever, maybe it's confined to a, a particular domain. The moment your production becomes uh, heavier or larger, you want to transport that one to a, a, a number of places, right? That's where the steam power and the water power is used for, uh, particularly for the transportation and also for energy production at the first point. So which happened somewhere in 1760, right? So that moves to uh, the second revolution uh, during which this uh, mass production becoming a, a, a key point. So you generate an innovation component or innovation product at one point and you want to market this innovative product to several parts of the world. So that is where the second revolution uh, are picking up. And parallelly, electricity is becoming the, the norm of uh, uh, the industry uh, 2.0, uh, where power makes uh, more things. Uh, power, makes, uh, uh, power is used as a bottom line uh, to realize whatever you wanted to have for it, right? So that is what happened in the second revolution. That is a period parallelly, if you look like uh, it started also the uh, uh, Second World War, uh, which actually makes uh, troops to move from one place to another places, which parallelly is the cause of the 1918 Spanish flu, which you should have heard about uh, in the newspaper also, right? So which is the first pandemic ever we, we heard of. Okay, let's go back, come back to the revolution. As we move to the third revolution, the third revolution is all about talking about the uh, electronic and the IT system, the automation process, right? Where the robotic is uh, uh, taking a major uh, role here, right? So when you see from the revolution one to revolution two, slowly the, uh, the product motion is towards globalization. When you see between two and three, the globalization becomes a bigger uh, market, meaning that you have a, a bigger market. Uh, from regional, it become like a national. National become like a, uh, uh, you know, like a international uh, market. But between uh, industry revolution 3.0 and uh, 4.0, the biggest change is on uh, utilizing the whole process of whatever we have been doing with the help of uh, uh, computers and communication. Right, that's what we are in the uh, industry 4.0 uh, revolution here. But if you look closely between uh, industry revolution 3.0 and 4.0 is where the uh, the transmotional uh, happens uh, in terms of uh, men, meaning that the transport becomes very cheaper, then people start to uh, move from one place to another place very fast. Okay, 
So if you see on the timeline of the total industrial revolution between the first and the second, it takes about 100 years. The second and the third, it takes around 80 years, right? Between the third and the fourth, if you see, it's around 50 years, right? So when we talk about the fifth revolution or the sixth revolution, so the uh, the duration of this type of revolution is going to be uh, going to be shortened, right? Okay, so this is what the from the engineering point of view, like we talk about the industrial revolution point, industrial revolution. But parallelly, if you compare in terms of the pandemic, the pandemic, first pandemic or, you know, the first known pandemic happens in 1918, uh, Spanish flu, where you can see we were only 1.8 billion, where you see the death is around uh, 17 million uh, people there. But look at now is over after 100 years of time, the population is 8 billion, but the death rate is, uh, is uh, slightly lower compared in terms of figure. But if you look at the number of uh, the ratio of the population to the death, it is actually uh, is, uh, is an alarming point of, uh, you know, alarming point for us to uh, relook where we went uh, wrong here. So that is where these uh, people are talking about the new normalcy, like uh, talking about, you know, like uh, sanitation, uh, talking about personal hygiene, uh, talking about, you know, like taking care of the individual and also uh, the distance, uh, the, what we call as a physical distance between the people when they talk, when they move, you know, all those things there. So. Uh, what I'm trying to dra drag you to this scenario is this is going to be the new normal, meaning that this type of pandemic is going to be uh, very often, uh, say, for example, uh, between the first and the, uh, and the latest pandemic, it takes about 100 years. The next one will take easily, uh, you, you can see and visualizing of another pandemic within 30 to 40 years of time. So, so now what we need to see as a um, uh, solution provider is like how to uh, make this as an, uh, a way to live with it, right? That's why they say, like, you need to know how to live with it, right? Okay, if you see uh, from uh, the case of uh, the known um, endemic or uh, epidemic, so-called epidemic like Ebola, MERS, or uh, uh, the COVID previous strains, right? Uh, the percentage of people affected is very, very smaller. Is because it is only confined to a certain area. Like, for example, the first known case was in China in in um, uh, November, December last year, right? Then you see now even within uh, within less than a year, the number of uh, people infected, it's not about the death, it infected is very heavily, is because of the, uh, particularly is because of uh, the motion of people from one place to the another place. And second thing, this strain, what we call as a COVID, uh, that second strain is, um, is more, uh, what is called more severe than the uh, previous strain, because uh, the carrier of this uh, of this uh, type of a uh, strain is making it to become like more stronger. So eventually, you know, it's very difficult for us to come up with an uh, immune system that can produce what is uh, produce uh, a uh, vaccine for it. So we have to understand the reality, like uh, this is going to be the new normal, where we are going to face a number of challenges in terms of uh, health industry. Uh, it can be an epidemic, it can slowly, uh, it can be an endemic that can uh, slowly become a pandemic within maybe three to four months of uh, uh, time here, right? So this is what we know uh, why we need to have a new type of educational model uh, to understand that the, the pandemic is going to be with us for a longer period of time, right? So what does this lesson uh, that gave us due, due to this outbreak? As you can see from here, uh, in terms of the government, the government like in India, for example, they convert the train coaches into a, a makeshift, uh, uh, what we call as like COVID what? Right in China, for example, they take a whole stadium, and the stadium is converted into a COVID uh, specialty ward or whatever may be. So this is from the government point of view to make, to sustain for this uh, uh, outbreak when it happens, uh, you know, like a, uh, without unknown source there. So when you look from the uh, academic point, like uh, like what we call as like a service industry, right? So we look at the demand, like the demand for the waste. Uh, face mask is becoming higher, our sanitizer is becoming higher, right? The actual player in the market, say, for example, a, a leather making a company, they move towards uh, making a PPE, 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 PPE take, uh, like kit, right? So this actually uh, is balancing out the supply and the demand. At the same time, they also shift the business from their core business to the actual demand of the business. In fact, with uh, Taylor's, we, uh, we also have this uh, maker space, right, which uh, actually uh, we, we develop uh, using our 3D prototype. I think this is very uh, common across all the universities are uh, doing like a, preparing a face shield and a face mask, right? Uh, to support for the uh, frontliners uh, who are fighting the COVID to uh, 
uh, you know, to become uh, minimal there. Of course, from the corporate side, um, now it become new normal that you work from home, right? So it's no, no, no new normal like you go to a place like nine o'clock and work until five. So now it becomes like work from home and it's uh, not a nine to five work. So now it's becoming, uh, you know, like a, uh, around the clock work. Like as, as you can see, some of us are working at different time zone, but still we align to the common uh, point here. So this is from the uh, service industry, uh, from the uh, university point of view and from the government point of view. But what will happen to our graduates or what characters these graduates need to have in order to sustain for this type of pandemic in the future, right? That's what's the biggest question for us to have. Uh, because at the end, uh, whatever may be the production, the delivery uh, pattern changes, right? Uh, at the end, uh, in education, our business is all about the student, right? So if we don't prepare these students to become a graduate, right, that can sustain to this type of a market, then it's going to be challenged. According to S&P 500 data, for example, if we take, uh, like in 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 my time uh, when i graduate for example a company's lifetime is uh, about 24 years to 30 years right uh, but the prediction for the graduate uh, when they go to the market in uh, 2021 for example the life cycle of the company is only 12 years of 12 years to 14 years of time that means when a kid goes to the job market in uh, 21 years when he um, when he become 30s right middle 30s right already that technology is gone off Right. So we cannot prepare for what the futuristic technology, technology uh, uh, demand. But what we can do is we can prepare the students to face uh, this type of uh, uh, scenario that is going to happen, uh, which is inevitable. Right. So we cannot uh, deny on that uh, aspect here. So that is what I am dragging you to uh, relook into our uh, the way we deliver to the students. Right. Uh, like for example typically we we teach them on how to be an uh, like an you know, intelligent kid you know intelligent question we call right then uh, put some emotional component to assess the student then of course we put some social question also including intrapersonal interpersonal skill but often we forget to uh, measure their students uh, uh, resilient uh, coefficient resilient coefficient is something like like how vulnerable these kids will be when they are exposing exposed to a new type of environment so this one is is, is the biggest question we have to uh, relook into that. Okay, now I drag to uh, the next case of how this one can be addressed, right? So I see this one in four dimension. So first thing is like you need to have revisit our curriculum. The curriculum needs to be uh, more of a flexible aspect, meaning that instead of telling them like this is a jigsaw, you give them a piece uh, a pieces of the jigsaw and ask them to come up with their own way of. Uh, uh, for example, one way of uh, subjects they want to choose. Like for example, I'm an engineering, uh, electrical engineering student. When I study, I study about 90% of my courses as electrical electronic engineering. 10% so I study only uh, a common course like mechanical course or, uh, or uh, uh, chemical engineering course, which might be more closer to my domain. But the real challenge is when I go to the industry, I need to uh, know the value of... Uh, uh, you know, working in a team, for example, like uh, uh, working in terms of a business point of view, working in terms of the local laws, right? So that's why I'm I'm uh, dragging you to have think about the broad-based uh, education, where the curriculum will give an opportunity for uh, allowing the students to go outside uh, what their domain. Like for example, I study in engineering. Probably I am very much interested in music. Why don't I take one course on music to? you know, add, uh, you know, like add value to my, uh, you know, my time spent in the university, right? That's what I mean by progress here. And of course, personalize, uh, we know that um, uh, all legs will uh, not shoot for all the shoes, right? So we have to think about that one to see, uh, to understand that um, uh, all size doesn't fit everybody, right? Of course, this needs to be in a way of a, a flexible environment, uh, meaning that, you know, like no norm, no normal, like an I teach you listen, rather than it becomes uh, the role will move from being a teacher towards a facilitator role where we go to mediate the thought process that is happening within the students in the classroom, right? So these are the three things that we need to relook uh, re into the curriculum uh, point of view. In terms of teaching, as a teacher, like, uh, uh, you know, like uh, we need to have variation in our uh, teaching style also because nowadays you know that uh, uh, after 15 minutes you, you, you cannot stay at one place. Like, like how many of how many of them like when I talk or when we talk right we go and check our WhatsApp status you know 
uh, like we go and check uh, what's the Facebook, uh, any Facebook new uh, new messages or not, right? So this is how this brain has been tuned for this uh, uh, generation. So you need to have uh, some sort of fun type of education blended into the uh, system. And of course, these kids are very, very much towards digital, right? So it need to be a digitally, uh, a digitally fun based uh, uh, teaching, right? That can be one of the way in which uh, the uh, teaching can shift. The third part is about the individual uh, individual uh, personality, like how this kid is going to be sustainable in the uh, future, forever, for example. So I, we call this one as a return from failure in uh, Taylor's, right? We insist that this is measured at the student when they are uh, when they are studying with us in uh, Taylor's. Okay, so to drag this one, you let's go back to our uh, early days of uh, anger, anger uh, time, right? So when we go with our... Uh, uh, when, when you are a very small kid, uh, for example, like we go with our uncle or father, we look at the sky and ask like why sky is blue, you know, why birds are flying in the V shape like that, right? So slowly you see the transformation as we move to the school and the universities, we slowly forget about the why, right? Rather we know that uh, we move to the how, meaning that uh, the teacher come and tell you how to read the how to read the textbook, for example, how to answer the question, how to score marks, how to become a good great student like that right slowly when we transform this how uh, component we already lose the creativity which is the key for answering the question of why okay let's move to the next one when they graduate uh, or uh, uh, we ourselves go to the company or the workplace uh, our boss come and tell you like what to do right he say like okay you do this one you have to complete this task within this place you don't know why you are doing right but if you don't you don't even dare to ask this why because you know that your job will be in trouble right so that is what the transformation of our brain happens. Uh, slowly, we losing the tend of the ten tendency of uh, having this uh, why uh, completely, uh, you know, disappear in our uh, mind stream. So this is what I call this as a, a killing the curiosity at the uh, first moment. So which is the key for being creative uh, personality. Without creation or without that process of creating, uh, we don't uh, have uh, opportunity to create or uh, generate an innovative product that can serve the society at last right the second picture you show is like i show an ant i call this as a, we call this one as an ant and it's a automatic uh, negative thoughts uh, that means the moment when you start to do something new right the first thing comes to our mind is uh, fear right fear of failure right so we fear because failure might happen and this failure might uh, might cause uh, an impact on you probably people will think like you are unfit for example right so that's why that's why failure, uh, you, we need to teach in the uh, university to make them to understand failure is a very common thing and it is a, a happen to everybody, right? So this one we need to embed into our curriculum. And the third part is whatever they are uh, uh, learning here, it can be translated into uh, the situation uh, demand. Uh, I call this one as, a, we call this one as a rewiring, uh, brain rewiring. So there are still three stages in this uh, process. Brain writing is something like uh, you go and check on your facts Meaning that when I uh, come when I come and ask you to uh, do an out of uh, out of box thinking, right? So we, I go and check on Google, for example, or refer with my friends. This is what we call as a brain writing, where you go and uh, uh, look for the facts and write for yourself. The second aspect is a uh, uh, brain wiring. So brain wiring is something like once you know the facts, you try to uh, uh, give an abridged version or an enhanced version, such that this. Uh, uh, writing becomes a wiring uh, part here. But brain, um, brain rewiring is something like uh, uh, you have to think opposite of your wiring uh, component. So uh, if some problem is solved, for example, and you know there is a limitation, then we need to look at uh, the limitation and say that why not this limitation can be solved, right? So we need to prepare the kids to have, uh, you have to push, your kid, uh, push the kid in the university to that domain rather than uh, keeping them within this brain writing or brain uh, wiring uh, domain. There. Okay, so these are the four things which I think uh, uh, I, I would like to share to you. And this will yield uh, towards what we call as a super smart city. Uh, inside the small, super smart city, uh, one of the big component is the education component, which you can see from the five. Uh, so it blend the teaching and the learning, right? Now the teaching is becomes like a more on the broad base. It becomes like a personalized and it becomes like a mixed way of uh, learning, teaching learning, right? So of course you have to move out from the conventional type of uh, teaching, uh, teaching, uh, teaching learning uh, partnership uh, towards a fun-based uh, learning, 
right of course it is a biggest challenge for the teacher but you know if you move then you will slowly start to enjoy uh, and this will lead to an assessment where people will move away from the conventional gpa towards the outcomes driven so once we have an outcomes driven we clearly define what we expect from the students to achieve and we we measure that one before they graduate uh, so we also have outcome based education in uh, across the uh, globe but this outcome based education is only measuring based on the cgpa uh, which is not going to help the uh, kids to sustain in the future okay i think uh, that's all with me uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity given uh, over to you uh, dr sharu thank you so much uh, dr arvind it was a wonderful presentation bright and informative we have uh, come to know many aspects uh, and like we refresh our memories the recent memories like and these informations are priceless and like we are we are very much uh, we appreciate your uh, nice presentation and i would like uh, the audience to note down the any questions or like any observations or anything that you would like to ask our panels you know, what we will do uh, after all our guest panel uh, speakers once they are done with uh, we will have a short q and a session and on that time you can place your queries your questions then we will get back to you so uh, coming back to our uh, symposium uh, now i would like to hand over the floor to dr marie helen uh, from laurentian university all the way from canada Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I will just uh, share my screen now. Okay, so um, I'm uh, Dr. Marie-Hélène Fillion, Assistant Professor at Laurentian University in Canada. Uh, this is what our campus uh, looks like. So um, if I go to the next um, slide. Sorry, one moment. Okay, so Laurentian University serves uh, over uh, 9,400 students. So as you can see, it's a small uh, university, smaller than uh, some of the bigger university we have in the world. Uh, our main campus is in Sudbury. So this is in Ontario, Canada. And it's uh, one of the two bilingual university in the province. So the two languages are English and French. Uh, myself, uh, French is uh, my first language. Uh, the campus uh, has uh, had a steady growth over the past five years. So for example, um, uh, a new student residence was built. Also, um, uh, modernization of classrooms and also labs. Uh, completion of an ex executive learning center. Also, a university club uh, was uh, put in place. And one of the most uh, amazing facilities is the Cliff uh, Fielding Building House. So this is for uh, engineering. So this is actually for research, innovation, and engineering building. So uh, a lot of engineering labs, but we also have other groups, uh, research groups that can be part uh, of that building. So it has uh, new engineering laboratories, also modern and well-equipped working spaces for engineering graduate students and also for researchers, and a fully equipped uh, fabric fabrication workshop that support uh, teaching, research, and also innovation. Um, mental health is uh, very important to Laurentian University. So Laurentian University is committed to provide and also to maintain healthy and safe working and learning environments for all the workers and uh, students. And we have many resources that are available for employees and students, uh, such as workshop, counseling and teaching for course instructors to be able to recognize, uh, for example, the signs uh, for students that may need help. So this is very important, especially in times of um, pandemic situation. Um, and uh, one part that is really important for everybody is staying physically healthy. This is an important step to reduce uh, stress. This has been proven in many studies. And a great advantage of the Laurentian campus is uh, the proximity to cross country trails and also uh, to be able to exercise and enjoy nature. Uh, I give an example here. Um, we plan activities uh, for an international student uh, workshop that we held on campus. This was uh, prior to the pandemic though. Uh, so this year um, you may uh, expect some uh, two meter social distancing this winter, but uh, we um, uh, organize a Nordic skiing activity for them to be able to uh, experience the Nordic um, 
Nordic um, environment. So um, the feedback was really good. They really uh, had fun th this day. Uh, the Barty School of Engineering at Laurentian offers degrees in mining engineering, mechanical and chemical engineering. Uh, the students can also be part of the co-op uh, program to gain practical experience during their degree. So this is a four to a 16 months program. And one of the strengths of the engineering programs at Laurentian University is um, that uh, we collaborate closely with the industrial partners and we can organize uh, many field trips because we are in the center of the mining industry here, especially for mining, this is really good, but for the other programs as well, because mechanical engineering and chemical engineering is closely related to the mining activities that uh, are occurring in Sudbury. So we are able to organize many field trips for the students and also to access modern, modern equipment for delivering a quality lab. So the school obviously needed to modify the hands on activities because of the COVID-19 situation to make sure that we have we follow the health and safety guidelines that are provided by uh, the Canadian government and to ensure also safety for the students while maintaining a high standard for the labs and field trips. Uh, Laurentian University um, was the first university in Canada to recognize the severity of the outbreak and also to suspend all in-person activities. Uh, so Laurentian is a leader in the uh, response to the COVID-19 situation. Um, it's also the first Canadian university to tra transition fully from in-person to remote learning. Uh, the, the other university followed uh, closely after, but um, because we had one case related uh, to a symposium in Toronto and uh, the university um, closed every facility very uh, quickly. Um, and also the university responded quickly to the needs of the community by uh, creating also personal protective equipment and medical equipment uh, for the community. And uh, the university also implemented a phase return to campus plan. So this is a three, three phase uh, plan uh, to be able to provide flexibility and also to adapt to the government protocol. So we have um, three phase. Phase one is one B, one A and one B. So phase one A already occurred uh, in June. Uh, in June. So this is the resumption of research and graduate studies because as you may know, a lot of uh, graduate students need to access the lab facilities to uh, be able to continue in their research. So this was kind of a priority to allow uh, those graduate students to be able to access the lab. Uh, phase 1b uh, actually occurred uh, two days ago. So this is the resumption of academic studies and other operation. Uh, basically, professors are allowed to go back on campus uh, if they want to fill, uh, if they have, and they have to fill a form to get access, and all forms are approved by the university to be able to put in place a schedule so we don't have too many people on campus at the same time. Phase two will occur in September for the fall uh, term, and uh, this uh, implies uh, to continue increasing on campus research and also scholarship activities. And finally, phase three, uh, this is to be determined because we have no idea how things are going to happen in the fall, but hopefully this is uh, the step where we have returned to a new normal. So the return to campus plan also comprises a hierarchy of uh, controls for COVID-19 and the most effective that has been recognized is uh, physical distancing. In the case that this is not possible, uh, control measures such as uh, physical barriers, additional sanitizing stations are considered. Uh, also, the third one is admin administrative control, so such, uh, such as procedure to follow, uh, for example, filling a COVID-19 screening form before entering campus, or sch uh, scheduling, so scheduling for limited access to office. So those uh, steps are also implemented. And finally, the last one is uh, personal protective uh, personal protection equipment. So a lot of equipment was ordered by the university for the students and also for the staff during the summer to be able to uh, be ready when uh, campus um, reopen partly in the fall. So regarding the fall uh, courses uh, for this uh, fall term, uh, this fall 99% of the classes will be delivered remotely. Uh, this is a high percentage because we still want to stay uh, on the safe side. 
and the remaining 1% uh, that are necessary due to mandatory hands-on activities uh, will be uh, delivered on campus. So this is where we have no choice. Students need to manipulate equipment themselves to be able to learn adequately uh, the techniques. So this is going to be held on campus. And obviously, uh, everybody will wear masks uh, for in-class activities. Uh, different modes of uh, teaching are considered. So we have remote teaching only and also hybrid uh, teaching. So I think this is the case for many universities in the world. Uh, for uh, remote teaching, there's uh, two options, synchronous teaching that can be performed uh, principally. Uh, what we use here is the Zoom meeting platform for live lectures. And uh, when we talk about asynchronous teaching, so this is performed uh, bit, uh, using our um, man learning management system. In our case, it's the platform called desire to learn D2L. Uh, and we can use uh, as a faculty the, this platform to upload learning material, plan remote quizzes and exam, also uh, put in place some online uh, forums for the student to be able to uh, share ideas. And we also have um, access to the Panopto video platform. So this is um, a platform where the students can access a link to online lectures and watch the lectures on their own time. So the faculty will pre-record the lecture and the student can watch the lecture when they have um, time to uh, spend on this uh, particular course. Uh, the other option is hybrid teaching. So this can be for labs or other end on -end activities only or to allow small groups of students to attend in-class lectures while other students, for example, are attending via Zoom meetings. So we can have part of the students in class and part of the students attending uh, remotely. And uh, finally, a new very interesting addition uh, that Laurentian University put in place is um, the, the six remote enabled classrooms. Uh, that we can book uh, as faculty members, we can book. Um, so this is the um, what it looks like. So we can see on a big screen the students, so our class and the teacher is uh, doing the same than he will do in a regular classroom, for example. So this is really uh, great and hopefully we'll get more of those in the future to be able to um, have a great, to provide a great teaching and learning experience for the students. Uh, regarding the changes in uh, the engineering programs, um, the the engineering program include um, the changes included setting up virtual machines. So this is to ensure that uh, students have a safe access to engineering software, and the uh, virtual machines uh, are grouped for uh, the different programs. So for mining, chemical, and mechanical engineering specifically, with the software that the students uh, need for um, the 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 requirement of their specific program. Uh, also, virtual laboratories are put in place uh, in um, collaboration with the technologists uh, in the different programs. And this include recording uh, video demonstrations for the labs, for example, and uh, providing data set to students for the analysis and writing their report um, afterward. And also another interesting part is uh, virtual field trips. So, of course, Laurentian, uh, specifically in mining, is recognized for the quality of the field trip that we can provide uh, for the students for practical experience on site. Uh, obviously, this won't be possible uh, this fall, maybe not this winter uh, as well. So, what I started to do is uh, collaborating with our, our industrial partners in Sudbury to create some kind of virtual field trips. So, this is going to be video type field trip with different aspects of uh, I show a picture here. This is an example for uh, an underground mine visit. So they will see every steps of underground mining uh, via videos, quality videos that uh, are taken on site close to uh, campus. And uh, finally, uh, one thing that was really important was to determine what can be a good assessment method for the students because obviously standard uh, exam uh, will not be possible. So we uh, had many discussion on alternate assessment methods that are suitable for engineering, because as you may know, we need to be able to assess the quality of the calculation in engineering. Uh, so this is not really appropriate with um, quizzes online, for example. 
Uh, and also those discussions occurred with other Canadian universities. So alternate assessment method can include, for example, home exam, uh, online exam uh, via teaching platform, or a mix of both. So we can assess uh, some uh, skills with uh, question which are to answer online and have an home exam for the calculation. And also some final examination can be replaced by a final project to assess the, the skills that the student gain during the program or the, during the course. Um, I thought it would be interesting to give you uh, the perspective of one of my uh, students. Uh, Amit Karimi is an international student uh, at Laurentian University and is also um, living in the student residence. So this is to provide a different perspective for a student point of view. Um, is uh, actually on campus, uh, even if there's not much going on campus right now. So what um, he did is uh, giving uh, some feedback about the education, uh, what happened in the student residence, the facilities on campus, and also uh, financial support. So regarding the education, he appreciated the swift transition from classroom ed education to online format and also the frequent notification that he received from professor teaching assistants and uh, other students uh, require, uh, regarding the change to expect. So um, one thing that is really good is we get weekly emails uh, notifying us of what is going to happen next and what is happening right now and trying to answer questions and redirect people to frequently ask questions. So this is really appreciated by the Laurentian community. And also for the residences, uh, of course, increase the sanitation practices, uh, recommendation for using elevators, stairways, and other facilities, uh, increased security for entering the residence to make sure that um, everything is safe for the students in the residence, and also frequent communication regarding any change or news uh, for the residences. And uh, for the facilities, uh, all the unnecessary facilities were closed. So less people are present on campus. And there's a, also an increase of uh, sanitation practices. And finally, uh, one thing that was really good and appreciated by the students is that the university put in place a COVID-19 emergency financial aid for the students in need. So the student needed to um, apply to that by uh, stating what are their current um, funding situation and apply for um, different amount uh, of uh, support. And another part of the response, plan, the response plan is the addition of a web page to the university website. So this is to provide information to uh, three categories. So local students, the first box at the bottom, uh, faculty and graduate students in the form of frequently asked uh, questions. And there's also an information live chat that is available for any other type of question that you cannot find in um, the frequently asked question um, boxes. And uh, resource is also available to students and employees for mental and physical health. Uh, Laurentian take it very seriously. And um, also we can have a virtual connection to interact with peers, even when working or stu studying from home, which is good to stay connected to uh, our community. And uh, finally, if what everybody asks, what is next in uh, phase three? So phase three means that all research and scholarship activities are able to return to campus and possibly under the blended delivery model. So when we say blended delivery model, this implies a portion of traditional face-to-face -face instructions that will be reply, replaced by a web-based online learning. So basically a mix of both, and that will become the new normal, and that may ensure that we have less people on campus, so less chances of um, contact, contracting uh, the virus. Um, this is all I have uh, today, so uh, thank you very much. That was a really good uh, opportunity. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I will be available after um, the other presentation to answer your questions if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks to Professor Marie uh, for her uh, wonderful, insightful uh, presentations. And uh, it's very, really impressive that Laurentian University they're taking such initiative in this uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, so that um, uh, the student uh, satisfaction and all the activities 
Hey, and do not impact and give any negative uh, impact towards the education and like uh, the we move on with uh, coping up with the current uh, scenario so uh, once again uh, i will uh, <clears throat> I, uh, suggest the audience to take notes of your questions uh, addressing to any of the specific specific panel members or a general panel so once all our distinguished uh, keynote speakers are done with the presentation, we will take uh, take it for a Q and A session. So uh, for those audience who just joined uh, and uh, missed the introduction, we would like to uh, refresh your memories that we are having this international symposium on cross border Canadian cross border academic environment and navigation towards the new normal. So all the four countries: uh, Australia, Canada. Uh, Malaysia and Bangladesh are joined and to, to give you truly a cross-border academic environment and from Australia uh, our Dr. Jayasri from New South Wales, Sydney is present from Canada, Dr. Marie uh, from Laurentian University is with us uh, from Malaysia, Dr. Aravind from Taylor University and from Buet, uh, Professor Celia Shahnaz, the IEEE chair is present with us. Uh, so let's go to our next uh, keynote speakers, which is Dr. Jayastri Ravishankar from the uh, University of New South Wales, all the way from Sydney, Australia. Thank you, Professor. I move. Thank you, Dr. Sharuk. So uh, let me share my screen as well. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here and thank you for having me. So um, I will, I'm from the University of New South Wales in Sydney uh, from the School of Electrical Engineering. I'm Associate Professor and Deputy Head of School Education in Electrical Engineering. So I will take you through the journey of how we manage the pandemic and uh, in terms of teaching and learning and in terms of our research. So <clears throat> a brief about our university. So our university um, is ranked 43 in the world in the QS World Ranking. It's a large university with around 60,000 student enrollments. We are more than 60 years old, started as a technology university and now a big university with around nine faculties, uh, including the Faculty of Engineering. We have Faculty of Medicine, Law, business uh, every other faculty and we have around 900 academic programs within the university and as you can see uh, we are very high in international numbers around 40 percent of our students are international students from around 137 countries so which means the covid had a major impact in our university so what did we do now uh, also i'm because i'm from the school of electrical engineering a bit about the faculty of engineering so engineering has eight schools um, so you name any any type of engineering civil computer science mechanical electrical we also have a special renewable energy school so we have all these schools and we are the largest faculty within unsw so we have around 17000 plus students just within engineering now, just in terms of the number of students, as you can see, the civil and computer science are the largest schools um, here. And 63% uh, of the students are undergraduates with 31% postgraduate coursework students doing uh, masters in engineering. And then we have around 6% higher degree research students who are doing masters by research and also PhD. And most of these HDR students and 90% of the postgraduate students are international and we do have around a few of uh, the undergraduate students international as well. So in terms of rankings, we are number one in Australia and uh, this is uh, idea of the world rankings. We are in different uh, ranking scales uh, and we are rated five star in terms of employability teaching and research as per the QS star rating as well. Now, some of the highlights specifically in engineering. So this number one in Australia is specifically for engineering. Now, within engineering, we have a number of programs which helped us move uh, right through the pandemic very easily. So some of the programs we have are the challenge projects, which is which includes students uh, projects, which could be engineering and also interdisciplinary. For example, we have the vertically integrated projects. So students from any year, like right through from first year of engineering to the final year and also the postgraduates can join a particular project. We have the maker games and the maker spaces where industry gives us the problem and the students are able to do a project with that. And then student led projects as well. So some of the 
photos are here where students have done different projects. Um, and then we also look for projects that have a social impact. Uh, now we run what is called the Design Next. Design Next is a special uh, interdisciplinary program within engineering. So where it encompasses uh, industry experience of students along with uh, their uh, capability to do uh, a small project. So these are available for coursework students, not just specifically research. And we also involve a lot in terms of the global impact and social engagement where we work closely with the universities in Myanmar, developing countries where they require our support. So we help them develop their curriculum in Myanmar, in university in Gulu. Um, so we often visit them and then help them develop their curriculum as well. Now, uh, the most important highlight is the digital uplift of our courses. So we have already uplifted our courses digitally way before the pandemic. So let me go into what we did through the digital uplift. So digital uplift, this was initiated in 2017. Um, around 350 courses across UNSW are already digitally uplifted. So we have a special team under the Pro Vice Chancellor Education Office. Um, who are employed to inter interact with the academic staff who are interested to digitally uplift their courses. Um, so what we do is we add a lot of digital resources to the courses as a support resource. Apart from the face-to-face -face teaching, we added all those as a support resource in order to improve the experience of the students, learning experience of the students. So where we took course re redesign, we are embedded digital assessments through that. Uh, we added lots of interactive videos um, and also industry uh, blended videos where we either uh, do a virtual reality in the on-site, virtual reality simulations using on-site videos, and then also the guest lectures and industry speakers explaining the industry aspects. So it's like a virtual tour where they can even see interaction with the industry people, lots of animations. And then in terms of um, assessments, we added lots of adaptive tutorials, which means like uh, we can create numerical questions online. Um, and then these numerical questions, you know, it's like programming where every student gets a different numerical value so that even if it's an online exam, it's easy for them to, you know, like it's easy for us to uh, check that the students cannot just directly copy from each other in the online assessment. So they, they have to work out because each one gets a different value um, so that, that's all been set up long before. And we also run what is called the Course Design Institute every year within engineering, where again, we train around 20 academic staff every year to help redesign the course. It's an intensive program. It's a one week program during the term break where you know, like people can plan and we give them lots of ideas. So all these uh, online uh, digital uplift uh, takes care of this uh, three elements, which is the teacher presence, social presence, and our cognitive presence. So where even though it's an online environment, students can interact with each other very well, and they can also have the teacher's presence, and then they can support each other with the material. So they are already arranged something like a social media page. So it's easy for students to comment and uh, support each other as well. So we had animations and these are, you know, like uh, just like a blackboard type of teaching. We have a glassboard facility where, you know, like you you uh, do the teaching on one side of the glassboard and then it's been recorded on the other side. So it's like just uh, like uh, the old style blackboard teaching that's been video recorded. So students find it very, very useful, especially for engineering type of courses, which is heavily analytical. So you can explain them step by step. And then these are the adaptive tutorials. So we give them the questions and then uh, varying values and the students can work out. And then this, this comes as a rotating image and a 3D image so they can see exactly how the system looks like. And then some of the discussion type of videos also we do again, you know, like as if a professor is discussing with the student. So the student is asking some um, simple doubts and then the professor is able to explain. So such the type of misconceptions, clearing the misconceptions of the students, we do a lot of videos as well. So we have a variety of videos so that students are not bored just by seeing a professor's face and then ha seeing them talk. So, and also we add a lot of captions in the videos it's because we have lots of international students, especially we are high in numbers from Chinese students. So uh, if, if they have difficulty following the accent of the professors, then it's easy for them to read through the captions and understand the videos. 
So some examples of digital uplift here, for example, this is uh, a page, this is how we organize the um, course. So each, uh, the course is divided into several topics and each course is, uh, each topic uh, is divided into further smaller subtopics. And then within the subtopics, there is a written material, also lots of videos embedded, so something like this. So this is, for example, a video. Again, it's like a blackboard where you can, you run through the annotations and then you take them step by step through the video. And in between, we also embed our face there so that it's like there is a teacher presence as well. And uh, we also ensure that each of these videos is not more than five or six minutes long. We try to break down uh, the topics into several smaller subtopics because we know the attention span for the students is not longer. So we break it into five or six minutes. And then immediately after that, this is like a social media page. So once they see a video, we add an activity below that. So students, you know, just to test the students' understanding. And then the students can do that activity, comment. And then uh, we, are, we can also do various arrangements. This, this platform also, you can see here, there is a green, uh, green bar here, which probably I don't know if you can see much. But then that gives a percentage. So that gives a percentage progress. So the students can see how much they have progressed within the course in terms of learning the resources. And uh, this is, for example, a activity we have. So we give them a problem, and then we ask them to share the image, work it out in a paper, just take a photo in the phone, and then share. And they can only see others' solutions and answers only if they post the solution. So we can have a restriction like that as well, so that we can improve the student engagement. So it's much better than the face-to-face -face engagement sometimes, especially because our courses are large, even in, for example, fourth year elective courses, we have 200 plus students. So it's much easier for them to engage online. So for example, this is a virtual reality simulation. So this shows a 3D uh, of a human body so they can rotate and see. And then um, this is actually in an electrical engineering course where we teach them what happens when a current flows through a human body. How does the shock current react within the body? So it's, it's a course specifically, specifically highlighting electrical safety. So again, therefore, they can see how the current path travels through the body and which parts it happens and then whether there is a ventricular fibrillation or whatever. So and then this is an example of a virtual reality simulation. So here you can see it's an operation theater in a hospital. So even if you take the students on a tour, they will never ever have a chance to see an operation theater. Uh, so here we explain to them, we take a 3D, a 360 degree shot of an operation theater. We explain to them how was, for example, electrical earthing done in an operation theater? What is happening? How do we safeguard the patients that are in the operation ta theater table? And you know, how do the doctors protect? And so we take it through that. And then, you know, there are, there are you know, in between, we can add a lot of hotspots there. So within the hotspots, as they click the hotspots, it blows up and gives a video of the industry speaker talking. For example, this is again in hospital. So we have we can see here one of the uh, safety engineers who has worked on the wiring of that hospital talking about how is the wiring done? Uh, how do we ensure electrical safety within the hospital? So they just talk showing the actual panels. So that gives a very good idea for students of how the course is practically related to everywhere. And this is a type of um, question, for example, sorry, uh, this is a type of um, question here. Again, this is uh, a numerical question. So as I said, every student would get a different value. And then as soon as they do that, you know, as a part of training, we uh, we can add a lot of feedback. For example, it says, good job, your answer is correct or, you know, incorrect answer. So we give them uh, three chances to try. So, but when they go for a second chance, it gives a different number again. So it's not that they are blindly putting some value, they have to calculate every time. And that way they get a lot of practice as well. So this is this is how the digital uplift is done. Therefore, when the, when the pandemic came through, how did we manage? So we had most of the courses uh, well prepared in terms of the digital resources. So what we did, the classroom face-to-face -face teaching, we quickly shifted to synchronous lectures by using uh, Microsoft Teams or Zoom, or we also used what is called the Blackboard Collaborate. So these are wonderful because there are lots of breakout options where we can break out, we can create breakout rooms for students, put them in different spaces, create a discussion as well. Um, and you know, with the digital resources available, there is also the recorded lectures already available along with that uh, synchronous lectures, lots of online forms. We created 
uh, remote labs as well because you know in engineering labs are most important and of course we had already created lots of digital assessment facilities so we were able to use that and we included oral assessments as well just to check if the students are genuinely doing some um, you know genuinely learning the courses and the one big facility we had because we had created all the digital resources the facility we had was something like this we were able to map how many students were engaged what is the daily activity of the students whether it's individual student or overall average so all the data was available for us to find out whether students are really engaged or not and then this is an example of a remote lab so we we manage lab in many different ways one is you know just offering a simulation type of lab for students where they can work from home the second is uh, taking a video of the lab demonstration and then giving the students to watch the video and ask giving also uh, uh, tailored readings, uh, lab readings for different sets of students so that they use those lab readings to analyze the lab work. The other thing is remote lab where what happens is in the remote lab, we can make the students through the MS Teams, we can connect the students to the lab equipment directly. So you can see here, this is the setup and we created our own plugin board a tailor-made plugin board through which the remote facility can be made possible. And then a demonstrator within the lab helps the students connect through the MS Teams to the lab monitors. So the students can directly control, for example, the oscilloscope, they can control from their end. They can control the monitors, the lab monitors from the end. So they can uh, create, control the function generator, for example, give a different voltage settings, and then they can control the um, oscilloscopes, get the results themselves. So this also we did um, during these times. And uh, we normally have a lot of industry partnerships um, and teamwork in our courses in the face-to-face -face offering. So we thought, you know, it's very important uh, uh, criteria, especially we are accredited by Engineers Australia and Engineers Australia insists that teamwork is a very important factor and also industry association in terms of learning and teaching as well. So like, for example, earlier, long before we were having, you know, something like this where industry speakers come to our classrooms and then start presenting and then student work in the classroom, sitting together in a team and do some work. So what we did is during the digital uplift, we already transferred this to this end where actually we, we created some of the virtual reality simulations. So students sit in teams, watch the virtual reality simulation together, clarify all their doubts, and then they create their own case study and make a presentation. And this presentation, you can see here, the people here are all industry experts. So the industry experts actually directly assess the students. So this is what we had been doing before the pandemic. So when the pandemic came, we converted it something like that, where the students did the teamwork through MS Teams. So we organize specific sessions for them to meet each other and then record the session. So we know that the students are meeting in teams. And then instead of making a presentation, they started doing, we asked them to do a video and upload it into the uh, learning management system. And then this video we sent to the industry experts who did the assessment of those videos at their end and then gave them their assessment. So we we didn't you know stop the students we still were able to connect the industry and we were able to close the loop during the pandemic as well some of the examples of students you know like how, what they are doing in unsw work from home um, this is uh, available here instagram upload so you can see here the students sitting in the uh, van mobile van and then trying to access the courses online and then some of the students you know working in their uh, gym of gym room at home and then doing the work how to be healthy and how to be active so students encourage each other through these posts through our facebook post as well now we also have the covid study online uh, website where we help the students to um, inform them you know all the issues you know how to, how can they manage to study during the pandemic also how to maintain academic integrity because we rely on students we uh, our university has a three term model so in the first term middle, first term runs from february to uh, april and then uh, during the first term halfway through the first term in march we had to go online halfway through and but we managed to even hold the exams online all the final exams were done online as well However, academic integrity, it's not an invigilated exam. So we had to inform students how to maintain academic integrity and stuff like that, keeping them healthy, all these things. So there is a website where students can access and lots of support provided. 
Now, what happens to our research program? We do have lots of masters um, by research students and PhD students. So if um, there were you know, students who heavily rely on experimental work in order to close their thesis, uh, PhD research, so what we did is if they are in the last term of their thesis and if they are unable to complete an experiment because they can't go into the campus, our university provided an additional one-term scholarship for them for 13 weeks because of uh, delays in the completion so so that they are uh, you know they can extend with some uh, financial support there uh, some emergency e vouchers were given um, for the students if they if they are in a critical condition you know if if for example they had to extend their stay in australia and then pay additional rents and stuff like that emergency grants of up to two thousand dollars per student we made it available interest-free loans we provided and we also, uh, Australian uh, government insists that um, international students can only work uh, 40 hours per fortnight, that is 20 hours per week legally. But then uh, the government announced because of the pandemic, they can work beyond 40 hours because um, to get some financial support as well for casual jobs. Uh, and then uh, for the new students who are commencing, who are offered uh, admission, but unable to come to Australia to take up their uh, um, PhD research, our university allowed international enrollments from overseas. So the initial part of research is usually literature review and then, you know, like having that connection and then all that. So we provided them all the facilities so that they can work from their country to start their research. Um, so and uh, this uh, we, we uh, stopped everyone until um, uh, May. And then from June, we started opening the first phase of the campus where we allowed PhD students with permission just for the lab access alone, if they had a lab work to be done as part of their research, we allowed them uh, after proper approval. So where they had to go through a training of how to be COVID safe before uh, they got the approval as well. So what next? So as I said, um, our first term, we went halfway through uh, into the pandemic. Uh, we managed to do our exams online, but then in the second term, which started in June, we planned everything online right from the beginning. So we were able to implement a few more remote labs and um, online uh, you know, experience for students. Uh, so the examination period will be coming up for the second term uh, starting next week, actually. And then a third term starts in September where we are planning to make a hybrid offering in the sense like um, students will be able to come to the campus to do their lab work face to face. However, we are making sure that the lab is accommodating only half the number of students than usual so that the uh, social distancing rules are properly followed. So if there are 20 students that can be accommodated in the lab, we will only take 10 students in the lab. So we have to organize several lab sessions. However, our uh, teaching will be totally online again. Uh, now that we have got a good experience and I think um, everyone is quite comfortable with teaching online. So we are doing that, but the labs will be face to face. However, as I said, since we have lots of international students uh, still who are unable to come to Australia to continue. So for those students, we'll be still offering remote labs. So that is our plan for the next term, which starts in September. So that's it from me. Uh, thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions uh, towards the end if you are interested. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Dr. Jasri, for her brilliant presentation. Uh, to the new audience, uh, we are conducting the International Symposium on Current Cross Border Academic Environment. It's a truly cross border environment. Uh, all the way from across the world, we are having uh, Professor, uh, Professor Jayashree Ravishankar from the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. We are having Dr. Marie Helene uh, from Laurentian University, Canada. We are having Associate Professor Dr. Aravind, C.V. Aravind from Taylor's University, all the way from Malaysia. We are having our distinguished uh, Professor Celia Shanaj, uh, the Buet Professor and uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, everyone knows her. She, she is the IEEE Chair. So uh, we are truly having an amazing session and I am very much thankful to my guest speakers like coming all the way from like the weird times like 7 a.m. from Canada. It's almost 9 to 10 p.m. in uh, Australia. So like, yeah, thanks to all. We're having a wonderful session. Uh, I would like to suggest the audience, if you have any questions, please note it down. 
Later, we will uh, have a Q&A session. You can place your queries there. So uh, until further then, I would like to hand over the floor uh, to our uh, um, dearest professor, Dr. Celia Shahnat from WIT. Uh, I give the floor to her uh, to uh, explain uh, her experience in COVID pandemic in academic sector. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharu. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, can you see it, Sharuk? Yes, I think uh, we're, we're good to go. Hello. Yep. Okay, yep. so you can see it, right? Okay. So thank you for taking such a timely initiative. Actually, <laughs> I was listening to others and actually... I will try to highlight uh, as a public university because I'm serving as a professor in the Department of Tripoli, Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. That is the highest ranked engineering university in, in the country. We have a lot of private and public universities who are offering engineering and computer science and IT education in this country. So although everybody was uh, facing a pandemic situation, but I should say that our uh, policymakers, our academicians tried their level best to handle the situation. Um, this is one of my bios. I'm working uh, for more than 20 years and among this total 20 years, more than 18 years as an IEEE volunteers. So what I, I must say that uh, during the pandemic situation, uh, I will summarize that how we are handling this actually uh, as a first public university in the country we have uh, we have started our trial class before um, uh, before in the month of uh, I should say in the month of uh, May and after that uh, we came up with uh, different rules and regulations so that uh, uh, in the name of online education, the quality should not degrade. And recently we came up with uh, uh, general guidelines, rules, assessment policies, and uh, different facilities to be created for our students because now the hostels are closed and the students, we have sent them to their village home where connectivity is a huge, huge problem. But you know, still our students and faculty members are very much determined to overcome those limitations. So we have different categories of institutional uh, universities who are financially not solved. Many, many universities are, are from, have good funding, good financial structure, but I'm trying to give you an overall uh, structure what every university uh, is following in our country that they're ensuring an institutional email account so that our students every student can access it for having online education and uh, we are ensuring a, a learning management system many universities who has newly started they may not have um, this LMS, but this during this pandemic, we all came together and we decided that actually every university should focus on preparing and developing a learning uh, management system. And which was not before maybe in different universities, but it is now become a common that there is a help desk is created to support all the technical problems faced by the teachers as well as the students and our teachers we have a since i'm from a public university we have uh, in our department where it is um, uh, we have triple e we have cse and we have it iict and many other and we have biomedical engineer where there are a lot of a uh, lot of hardware and uh, high voltage lab engineering biomedical instrumentation lab engineering and different labs are there is very difficult to uh, to make them 
look like a face to face class but you know still our teachers are working very hard for it but you know we have teachers from uh, from different age diversity so a teachers training workshop has been a common um, and uh, we all became united and unified to emphasis on the teachers training workshop because you know sometimes we are doing so many online webinars we may know about uh, we may know about the usage of Zoom, the usage of Skype from since long. But you know, if we want to use Microsoft Teams, we really need uh, such a type of training because our teachers we became too much committed to give more time uh, to equip ourselves for a better online uh, online uh, teacher, and also our students. Are, uh, for students, we are also um, uh, arranging this uh, training workshop so that they also know how to use different modules or how to use different Microsoft Teams or other things. And it became almost necessary for uh, which may which may have been uh, absent before that uh, digital classroom and digital laboratory with audio video recording facility, different softwares. So our university became uh, focused on buying those softwares, spending their time, talent, and treasure for uh, developing those audio video recording facilities so that. Uh, so that we can mimic those labs, which were hardware labs, which were software labs. But now students will be uh, appealing and appearing online. So it is important to uh, to replicate them as uh, as realistic as possible. Although no matter whether it is a hardware lab, although we will be using software. So these are the uh, different general facilities. Uh, we are focusing on and we are developing on and our university is putting all all its structure and all its uh, talent to develop such things and another important thing is that we were when we were doing our online classes trial classes we were using our personal laptops or microphones or our headphones now our universities what they're doing they are uh, doing performing a survey and a survey on the faculty members survey on the students this survey is very very important because we have BIIS a system a system by which our uh, our registration process is monitored, controlled, our grade system is uploaded and everything, a student-related BIS. But, you know, there may be many universities who do not have the capacity to develop this BIS to, to conduct survey uh, for on the students. So that's why we are inviting industries uh, to support our uh, those universities so that uh, they can develop that BIS and through the BIS the way which has uh, conducted the survey for the students because you know we are if we make the university equipped but there's a difference between the uh, Australia Malaysia and Bangladesh because many of our students are living in the rural community although they want to do class but they do not have the connectivity they may they may have dropped their laptop in the hall they may not have a proper microphone or headphones so that's why we have really conducted a survey from our bis that what is actually the need and assessment of the students what they really need to appear the online class and it is not to me it is not online education it is creating the environment of online education so that uh, although they are missing this face to face they are networking and working together in the library but you know we have to create the environment because many students may not have the facility maybe they are living in two rooms and they have so many brothers and sisters so we have to give them minimum facility because we are creating facility for the faculty members we are creating faculty facility for the 
uh, for the university, for the labs, but we have to really think about that how our student will be accessing those facilities. They are our most important stakeholder. That's why we have conducted, Buet has conducted the survey first that what our students need. They really need laptop, they need microphone, they need connectivity, they need 4G modem, what they need. Another important, through this survey, another finding for us, you know, that even if you can give them a 4G modem, you can, you can uh, based on the survey, but still, uh, there may not be a tower near their home. So they really need to move to some place where there is tower. So these type of practical problems are there, but we are actually mapping every student and trying to know every unique need of our students at Buet so that we can really reach them, those facility and ensure the facility for them. Then we teachers, we faculty members are, are training ourselves so that we can give them a proper online, online education, a proper environment so that they just don't give the exam. They became ready for having an education that have a real outcome and there it should and they should not have a uh, feel far difference between the online uh, teaching and the face-to-face -face teaching. The outcome should be almost similar. Although we are telling this pandemic will not be over and um, it is a new normal, but since it is a new normal, so we are actually at Buet, we are working very, very hard to make the online um, education uh, really an outcome-based education and there should be not far difference between the face-to-face -face education in terms of learning outcomes. And another important thing is that assessment, which is very important. But our syllabus was formed according to uh, on long back, Texas a and University as, at USA. And there are a lot of curriculum changes in our department in every five years. But now uh, we have to really follow, we are following what those universities are doing to accommodate the same curriculum so that we can adopt, adapt those changes very quickly. And uh, this assessment system is very important because for this assessment system, I think our teachers, uh, we are uh, doing so much brainstorming so that uh, uh, we don't give them an uh, online question answer session, which they will just memorize, they will write. We have to give them some take home exam, some innovative questions so that they don't discuss with each other. Even if they discuss with each other, their response would be unique. It will be a person specific. Uh, a, a different, every people's solution should be different. And such innovative questions, such innovative uh, home assignment that we are preparing ourselves to design. I think that is the most important challenge for a teacher. Uh, it's not that giving a lecture via Zoom. It's important that how important when I am giving a cardiac uh, activity, a 3D uh, thing I can show the video, but important thing is that uh, different angle, the posterior position, pos position uh, or uh, uh, lateral position. I must, which it was easy for me to show, but now it is not easy for me to show. But uh, now I'm finding the avenues that how I will uh, teach those biomedical instrumentation courses and the lab, hardware-based lab, like bilirubin estimation and non-invasive device that they are preparing, how we will give the demo of that thesis and project. And previously, the thesis and project was face-to-face, -face, and they used to come every week, and we had a whole day for research and discussion. And how we will mimic that environment how we will show that hardware set up to us, teachers and students collaboration will happen. So these are the important things we are strongly brainstorming. And to me is the most important part is the assessment.
to me most important part is uh, that whether this online classes duration uh, because you know if uh, for a certain day uh, some uh, out of 60 students if 30 students appeared and 30 students could not appear because of uh, the connectivity problem then we have to we may have a re we may receive a request of repeating the class that's why i am focusing and we are focusing too much on the accessibility uh, uh, ensuring accessibility of the students, then training the students, then training the teachers, and really preparing the digital classroom and laboratory for uh, for mimicking that environment. And we are ensuring the facilities all. And of course, there should be a monitoring. Our deans, our heads, all are monitoring that whether the facilities are properly utilized, even after the facilities is probably if some students, they do not appear in the class, then it is their problem. But we are taking class and we are giving all facilities, even after that, if the students does not come, then it is of course their problem. But we have to really make sure that we are giving them proper, facility here is the question because we have university in bangladesh with different financial structure here is the role of industry that how this 4j modem can be given to the students how the students uh, can live near the tower uh, so that they can get the strength because even if we can uh, make their sim 4g but if there is no tower they cannot get the connectivity our industry can help every student to have that connectivity not only that not all universities have bias and lms system our university our industries can help so that's why we are also collaborating with the industries telco companies and different in this industries that how these facilities can be provided by our provided to our students and our faculty members another important thing the faculty members are having different salary grade assistant professor associate professor and professor and assistant professor does not live in a house and uh, which is um, very much a cube, lot of rooms because he has his family, he has his children. So wherever he is taking class, there may be family members roaming around. So we have to also ensure that a teaching environment where a teacher is able to provide the delivery of the lectures properly uninterrupted. Of course, we may not decorate his home, but actually, we can create something in the university that is the digital classroom that will allow him actually to give a proper delivery of the courses so we are starting our after uh, creating so many regulations and so many um, so many guidelines to ensure the quality education what it was providing before so we are going to start our class on uh, with full online facility on 22nd august and after our trial classes so our experience in trial classes has um, helped us to come up with uh, so many solutions that helped us uh, to create so many guidelines and now looking at the universities in the united states and other part of the world uh, based on whom our curriculum is uh, developed we are learning from them and we are trying to uh, create facility as close as them so that uh, we can um, there should be no difference between the semester running during the covid 19 and the semester running before covid 19 because we are our students will be graduating from the same university which is good so with that said Sharu, i uh, try to conclude and not only that apart from the academic environment which is very important for iqsc quality assurance which is the co-curricular activities so we are actually engaging our uh, industries to conduct 
uh, and the world class speakers we are bringing through different webinars to keep our students engaged so that they can involved in covid 19 research like many of our students now now engaged in covid 19 the research related to extra images to use deep learning to find whether COVID-19 was there or uh, is there or not. So many of them are using the ultrasound images and deep learning to find the uh, whether there is COVID or not. Many of them are using city images also. Not only that, we have applied for fund and we received a fund from Global IEEE, uh, where we will be training our students that how to uh, build uh, a robot, disinfection robots, because one one day this uh, campus will be open. And this is another way of preparing the campus when it will be open. If they will be open, the campus will be open, then those robots our campus can use for disinfection, not only that our robots can we can collaborate with north city corporation so that our universities uh, students who were engaged in such online training and has received the knowledge of building the online disinfection robots they can be deployed to the local community in public places in following this is also will be a great outcome of our students and our faculty members to solve a problem in the local community and they can see during the covid 19 the research they have developed that is used for their community so it's not only a, a, a online academic teaching. For me, it is a complete environment, a complete education. That education ranges from our, our courses, our labs, our thesis, at the same time, our co-curricular activities. That is That will help for the deployment of our knowledge during COVID-19 to the local community. So thank you. Hope Bangladesh is doing very great despite many limitations. Our private universities are also doing very great. Let us all work together. And today, the uh, learning that we have learned from uh, Canada, uh, from uh, Malaysia, from Australia, and uh, also from Canada, ho hope it will be a good guideline also for all of us. And we will have a good things to take home. So thank you, Sharuk. Thank you, other. Uh, other panelists for the patients. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Dr. Celia, uh, for your <clears throat> insightful presentation. Uh, as I know, you're very busy. You're uh, having a, another webinar from 6.30. Uh, would you like to uh, uh, be present with us for another uh, 20 minutes or you need to go? Actually, it is already started. No, anyway, how many minutes we are here? Uh, 50 okay. to 20 minutes, uh, I have we to will check the more. WhatsApp. You carry on, okay? No problem. Okay, all right. So, having said that, uh, let's come to my presentation. So, I will take it. Uh, I will make it very short because all my distinguished faculty members, my fellow colleagues, already said uh, whatever I had to share. But <coughs> I will give some uh, brief information about uh, my university and our. Uh, managerial skills that how we are uh, solving our COVID uh, pandemic situation. Uh, before that, let's have one minute of demo of our university. The Canadian University of Bangladesh is easily accessible in Bonnani, in the heart of Dhaka city. The university occupies a modern student-friendly campus, equipped with spacious multimedia-supported classrooms, with laboratories featuring cutting-edge technologies and equipment. Its purpose-built campus on three acres of land in Pulbajo, Dhaka. The Canadian University of Bangladesh collaborates with eminent organizations across coveted sectors, including banks and companies Canadian University of Bangladesh is aiming to build its legacy in the field of higher education in Bangladesh. Canadian University of Bangladesh, inspiring applied knowledge.
Okay, that was the one minute of a brief demo about our, our university. Uh, we have uh, moved to our new flagship campus, the iconic uh, Rangsar Square. Uh, all the <coughs> students already know that we were from the Canadian University of Bangladesh. So let me uh, give a brief share about our online academic experience during the COVID and post-COVID uh, pandemic. So as we said, we have three schools. Uh, from the engineering, we have CSC, Tripoli, and Shipping and Maritime Science. From the School of uh, Business, we have B BBA, and for the postgrad, we have MBA and EMBA. From uh, liberal arts, we are having English, film and television, and <coughs> law. So uh, to cope up with the new normal and to uh, get ourselves habituated with the pandemic situation, the CUB, the Canadian University of Bangladesh, is among the frontiers in IT and automation since its beginning from 2016. So and, uh, we are the, one of the leading private universities uh, in online education uh, to take the lead you know, as soon as the pandemic occurs. Uh, we already had an automation, full-fledged automation system uh, that helps us going to the academia, going full-fledged online immediately after the university closure. Uh, we have the dedicated student support wing, <coughs> ensuring the student satisfaction in real time. We never compromise the quality. Uh, we have a dedicated university management system uh, that deals with online registration and admi admission. Uh, we also, for the academic activities, uh, we provide, uh, we give online attendance and class, the class schedule and all are uh, visible in the uh, university management system. Each student has its own portal. So whenever they go to uh, the portal, anytime they uh, get all the class schedule, their uh, attendance update, their registration status, their course add drop, everything are fully automated. And also the payment systems and all, all everything are fully automated. And this is one of the portal of the one of the departments. This is my Tripoli department. I'm the head of the department. We can see that this semester, like uh, 190 students already registered out of 229, which is the 83% registration status of the department. So all these things, uh, all fully automated. For the academic activities, what we did, <coughs> as Professor Celia uh, said, we had to ensure student satisfaction. That's why we had to go for immediate training to the faculty members. Uh, so when, uh, when we started these online activities, when the CUB went online, we conducted uh, <coughs> thorough training to the Sorry, it looks like uh, Dr. Shahrukh is uh, disconnected. So if if there are any uh, any other questions, please add your questions in the comments so we can address until he's back. Yeah, I think I will I will read the question. Probably one of you can answer. Uh, is yeah. there when COVID nineteen pandemic could be removed from our life? <laughs> is the actual is the actual version have discovered till now? No, we that's that's we don't know. Nobody knows the answer to that yet. So we need to see how we can manage uh, while the vaccine is being <laughs> created. You know, it may take time or may not. And even if the vaccine is uh, found, we need time for testing and creating more medicines. So maybe the travel will be restricted. It may take a minimum of another until at least the middle of next year to start traveling, in my opinion. Yeah. What do you say, Arvind or Mary? Uh, I think, uh, <laughs> as my, I mentioned, my presentation, I think is going to be, uh, it's not going to stop here. It's going to yeah. be having a, a newer version of strain. Only thing like uh, we need to uh, you know, negotiate with how we are going to balance out to live with it. You know? So yeah. uh, as you mentioned, like uh, I, we don't see as any uh, vaccine to be uh, commercialized and available in large at large, uh, uh, both in terms of uh, economical point of view and also in terms of volume. 
at least by middle of next year uh, yep minimum uh, next year Mary, yeah. uh, yes and the accessibility to vaccine yeah. is another issue not everybody will be willing to get the vaccine you cannot force people to get the vaccine even if it's uh, the best option option in my opinion uh, but some people are reluctant to uh, get vaccinated when they don't know uh, what's going to happen. So this is another issue. So I think we are going to need to learn to live uh, with that situation uh, to make the best off of it, out of it as we can. And hopefully um, this people will get um, exposed for sure. More people will get exposed, but still we can manage to minimize the the damage and uh, to be able to have a good quality life anyway. Yeah. So even even if the vaccine uh, uh, people are ready for the vaccine, it may not be affordable initially until mm -hmm. it's produced, manufactured in a larger scale. Mm -hmm. So the affordability may be also an issue, especially in uh, developing countries. So yeah, these are the issues. Yeah. Yeah. The challenge is also towards. Uh, the population size also like considering uh, india right, population yeah. and also right yeah china population mm -hmm. uh, yeah so it's going, going to be a real challenge for everybody uh, i don't see any uh, comments mm -hmm. further uh, probably uh, we make it a call yeah i'm fine with that but i'm not sure if the ovc wants to come or it's already uh, nearly 11 o'clock for Sydney in the night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Friday, Friday night, yeah, 11 o'clock. For maybe it's too early for you. Too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I just want to. Um tell the student who has question about Laurentian that I have answered directly in the in the chat. So we are taking a more uh, question related to COVID-19 if anybody has uh, additional questions or yeah. other so questions i as have well. answered a couple of questions as well um so yeah so should we should we contact sharuk by any chance i'm just trying to see yep okay. i will go offline thank you check first Well, in the meantime, uh, I hope that this was very informative for everybody who attended the live session. So I was very pleased to be invited to this session and I hope you learn uh, many things today and uh, hopefully that um, that reassure a lot of you. Yeah. yeah, there's actually, I saw a question here, challenge of distance learning on a COVID-19 situation. Of course, this is a challenge, especially with children. <laughs> I'm a mom of a four years old and uh, it's not always possible to keep them away, um, two meters away from their friends. That's really hard. For adults, even it can be a challenge. I see some people when we go outside, uh, some people don't really pay attention to that two meters uh, social distancing. So I think this is really important if we want to uh, get a better quality, be able to uh, continue our activities that everybody uh, is paying attention to that two meters distance. This is really important because the more people not respecting that distance, the longer we'll have to live in that situation. Yeah, in terms of uh, distance learning, especially uh, agreed that it's very challenging to do distance learning without any social face-to-face uh, -face social interactions. Um, however, I think this is a time you need to plan uh, systematically, you have to allocate times for learning, you have to allocate times to take a break, you know, like watch a movie, uh, go for a, I mean, uh, do some yoga, walking, just to keep you motivated. So you need to find ways of having, motivating yourself, you know, sometimes it feels like, especially in distance learning, even for us, it feels like we are there 24 by 7 because everything is online. So you need to find a way to uh, keep yourself motivated. Just yeah. keep contacting people through the online media. Yeah, I'm sorry. I read uh, quickly uh, distance uh, social distancing instead of distance learning. So I come. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah, that. but then uh, that's that's useful as well. Yes. Uh, what cost of engineering abroad? Are there any scholarship like fully funded uh, or half the scholarship? Yes. Uh, 
UNSW, there are scholarships available, but then again, it's, it's quite limited. Um, a cost of engineering uh, in UNSW depends on, you know, uh, you, it's, it's like if you want to do for one year of studies in UNSW, it will be around 45,000 um, Australian dollars uh, fee alone. So um, then, you know, like a plus, you need to have some living allowances. Yeah. What valuable skills do you think we should be learning in this pandemic? So <laughs> valuable skills, how to motivate yourself. <laughs> that is one thing. Um, how to how to interact with the facilities you have. Now, I think the online uh, learning has become a norm everywhere. People are easily connecting with each other. There are lots and lots of platforms available. I think it's an eye opener for everyone. So try and see whether you can do that. Try and see if you can uh, get some additional certificates. Uh, you can do lots of online courses offered by uh, very good universities um, abroad. You can just probably do one course. Yeah. Mary, you have any points to add? Yeah, I think uh, because we are going online with um, a lot of um, uh, software and uh, tools, uh, computer tools, I think uh, big data management is a good opportunity as well. Uh, anything related to engineering and big data management, I think this is the future. Uh, myself, I will look. Uh, how I can apply my scientific knowledge to big data management problem because this is going to be an issue as we continue uh, being in a virtual world like this. So um, in my opinion, there's a future there as well. Yeah. yeah, for me, I think it's more than the skill. I think it's uh, the pandemic is teaching us to be uh you know like uh, knowing about yeah. uh, the word resilience right so you need to make sure that uh you know be the graduates who is going to be you know like, uh, the students who today is going to be the employee uh some point of employer some point of time right uh the best skill or the important skill for the student is to know how to adapt to the you know like uh, the future uh environment where we actually don't know how it's going to be right we never mm -hmm. think about work from home uh and maybe one year before, but now it's becomes a uh, very new normal. And, you know, uh, we are slowly embarrassing that one, right? Uh, so I think the b important skill to teach in the university is, uh, as I mentioned, like uh, teach them failure is very common and teach them, you know, like how to overcome this failure, you know, like go towards your root cause and, you know, like uh, identify where you fail, then, you know, overcome that one. Then, um, you know, like, so that type of characters actually will build uh, in the university. It will help them in the lifelong. OK. Uh, yeah. So yes, so our Honorable Vice Chancellor just joined okay. with us. Uh, I think I got disconnected somehow. So I will just take one minute uh, to provide a demo uh, of all the COVID-19 workforce. Uh, those who are fighting uh, for us in the street. So let's have a look at that. After that, we will uh, give our closing session.
uh, yes, uh, with the conclusion of my uh, our, of our videos, uh, I would like to uh, welcome our Vice Chancellor, Canadian University of Bangladesh, Professor Dr. Mohammad Mahfuzul Islam. Uh, sir, I give the floor to you for some for ha having a few words to us and to the audience. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to attend you and to meet you uh, through this virtual environment uh, during this corona pandemic period. Uh, definitely, corona pandemic has changed our life significantly, uh, and as well as our education system. Uh, as the Canada, Canada University of Bangladesh uh, is running its online activities like all other universities uh, of the world, and we are working very hard and struggling, definitely struggling uh, with meeting the student demands. And at this moment, uh, the international seminar uh, on cross-border academic environment, navigation towards the new normal. It's a fantastic initiative uh, organized by the Innovation and Commercialization Center of Canada University of Bangladesh. And I want to thank Dr. Shahrukh for that one. Uh, I want to thank all our speaker, Dr. Joyasri Ravi Shankar, Department of Tripoli, University of New South Wales, Australia. Uh, Dr. C. V. Alvindo, Faculty of Innovation and Technology, Taylor's University of Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Mary Helen, uh, Department of TPV, Laurentian University, Canada. And Dr. Sevia Shahnath, Chair, ITPV Bangladesh Chapter, and Professor, Department of TPV, Puyet. All you are the distinguished uh, professors in the world. and. Uh, I have gone through your profile, so you, you have the fantastic profiles. You are doing a great for the nation. Actually, after every pandemic or every disaster, there is some good points. I am not uh, only looking at the bad points. Uh, if we look into the second world war, after the second world war, we have got all the technologies invented. Similarly, during the corona period, we have learned how to teach students from home, how to assess the students staying at home, and how to run our offices and our private government, every offices from the home. So we have learned how to act online, how to become the global uh, citizen of the global place or global uh, world. And dissemination of knowledge, currently the knowledge has been disseminated through the internet uh, and uh, if we go to the YouTube, Google, and there are lots of suppliers available in the world where we can add the knowledge. But this is the world that is not dictated only learning the knowledge. Students have to learn skill beside their knowledge. And for this, applied knowledge or industry-oriented knowledge is very important. And students, after graduation, they have to meet the global competition, uh, definitely. So. Uh, People are passing from different parts of the world, but compete each other uh, because the world is global now. And for this reason, during this COVID pandemic, we have learned it is very necessary that we have need to create contents and we need to collaborate with each other. Uh, and we need to do research together. We do need to do innovation together. We need to generate applied knowledge. And we need to uh, create and maintain the global contents for the students or for the graduates, undergraduate and postgraduate students and the researchers so that we can get a big jump using the technology. Uh, the distinguished speakers who have given the presentation today uh, all are from the different countries, uh, one from Australia, uh, another from Malaysia, another from Canada, another from Bangladesh. So it's really a good combination covering the overall world. So although the number of speakers is four in this symposium, but these four speakers definitely represents the whole world. So it's a great pleasure for us. And definitely the people who have uh, attended this uh, session through using Facebook and social media uh, and other web uh, streaming. They have learned a lot, I believe. And I want to thank all the speakers, uh, especially uh, in there is a gap of time 
from country to country and they have to manage the time from different parts of the world. So I want to thank Dr. Joyce Sridabin Shankar, uh, Dr. C.B. Aurobindo, Dr. Mavi Helen, and Dr. Sevilla Shanas for giving their valuable time and enriching us through showing how we can go forward with the pandemic situation. Thank you all. And also thank you all, thank you uh, ICC for inviting me in this closing ceremony. I hope that with your effort, that we will go, how do we go with a big ahead and we can run lots of technological advances in case of education. Thank you all. Thanks to Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir. Uh, uh, we are at the last session uh, of our symposium. Uh, however, we will take a few questions, uh, a few questions already being answered in our Facebook walls by our distinguished faculty members. Few of the questions, we will take it on hand. Uh, Tariq Rahman Ridoy asked question, is the actual vaccine have discovered till now? Our engineering knowledge is working for the world on this COVID-19 pandemic. He asked this question to the cross-border education. So I leave it to the floor. Maybe uh, one, of, one of the foreign uh, faculty members answer it to the Bangladeshi students. Yeah, um, Sharuk, we just answered because you got disconnected. Oh, we answered yeah. all those questions already. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, we, the, were, we were engaging the audience through the by answering the questions. <laughs> okay, so I will just yeah. uh, I I don't know where I got disconnected. I was like busy with my presentation, then suddenly I got I saw. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I will just take two minutes uh, to uh, revise my revision and uh, my presentation so that uh, it does not get incomplete. So allow me for two minutes. So we are already at the end of our session. Everybody is so busy, I know. So just give me two minutes to ensure my satisfaction. Okay. So uh, I think we covered that academic environment. Can you can you see that? Can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, so Canadian University of Bangladesh, uh, uh, when going remotely online, uh, faculty, we uh, conducted faculty training. Uh, we are going for online class and assessment in our pro account, Moodle for course materials, uploading, everything. We provide personal consultation one-to-one. -one. After the course, uh, we upload the video and the lecture materials and any student who cannot access to the internet that time, he can come back anytime and like look at the materials and any issues any problem they uh, come back to the course that course teacher and we provide one-to-one -one solution we have batch by social media group as we can see uh, so then this this is our Moodle interface the uh, ems system then we have dedicated ssw 24 by 7 digital real-time query management personal consultation we are providing a virtual town hall meeting every week two times for each department we take to address any issue from the students in online to ensure students satisfaction. And we have batchwise Facebook, uh, the WhatsApp groups, and at the same time, we have academic online platform groups so that we march together to make sure no loopholes or no issues have been left unentertained. Uh, social academics during the pandemic, uh, we uh, try to add small, small, uh, our uh, try and uh, like our contributions to uh, develop the society and to support the society. Uh, we manufactured hand wash, distribute facial masks, and took project and relief distribution, digital awareness, and many other things that other universities and other organizations simultaneously doing. This is a combined effort for this COVID pandemic, and we need to come up with uh, with the uh, we come up from this uh, problem uh, combinedly. It's a team effort always. So yeah. So having said that, I conclude my presentation. So. Uh, for those audience who just joined a uh, few minutes back, uh, people are joining uh, for the refreshing the memories. Uh, uh, we are having this uh, we are last se closing session of our international symposium uh, on uh, current cross-border academic uh, uh, environment, navigation towards the new normal. We are having uh, four <clears throat> international uh, distinguished faculty members and researchers from uh, world top Frank universities from the University of New South Wales, Australia. We are having Professor Dr. Jayasri. We are having Professor Dr. Murray from uh, Laurentian University, Canada. We are having Professor Dr. Aravind from Taylor's University, Malaysia. 
we had our uh, professor dr celia uh, from buet he had another uh, uh, webinar he had to leave and in our closing session we have our honorable vice chancellor canadian university of bangladesh so the symposium is organized by canadian university of bangladesh and we are very much thankful we are honored it's an absolute uh, pleasure to have all these distinguished faculties from across the world in one platform uh, i'm grateful to all of your support and uh, canadian university of bangladesh is emerging as one of the finest universities and we will continue looking to conduct this kind of symposium webinars and live events and we seek your support and um, uh, maybe in the near futures uh, i invite you all to join us and also when the covid pandemic gets over maybe inshallah we will uh, have a physical symposium a physical conference and uh, you all must have to attend so i give one minute to each of our distinguished faculty members to uh, say a goodbye <coughs> to the uh, audience and uh, then we will conclude the session uh, dr arvind you first yeah uh, uh, so, so it was very uh, very pleasure meeting you all uh, particularly as you mentioned like it is uh, uh, it's coming from time uh, time different zone uh, particularly for dr jayshi it's already it's very late to i think it's close to 12 uh, thank you very much uh, uh, dr sharuk and also the vice chancellor to honor us uh, to be part of this dr uh, marie thank you very much Yes, I want to thank you very much, and especially you, uh, Dr. Sharuk, for inviting me to this great session. Um, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions about Laurentian University or coming to study in Canada. Uh, probably uh, you, you can find my email on the Laurentian University website for sure. So I will be available to answer any question that you may have at the later stage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jasper, please. Thank you all, all for being well, here. I'm very much sorry. <laughs> no worries at all. So thank you very much for all the participation and the wonderful questions. Very nice to see the enthusiasm of all the attendees. Um, and I'm proud to say that we have lots and lots of Bangladeshi students that are doing PhD research with us, and uh, they are really very good students. So if we are interested in applying for a research program or even a master's by coursework program, please free to contact us. And uh, for if anyone is interested in electrical engineering, I'll be coordinating um, for the master's program as well. So feel free to send me an email. Uh, happy to answer all your questions. And um, you know, I hope you all stay safe during this pandemic. Take care. Thank you, Professor. Okay. So with the permission of our closing session chair, our Vice Chancellor, Canadian University of Bangladesh, Professor Dr. Mahfuzul Islam. I would like to officially conclude um, our international symposium. Myself from uh, Canadian University of Bangladesh, Dr. Muhammad Sharif Adnan Khan, officially signing off. Uh, please stay tuned for the next episode. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank Bye -bye. you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.